Do you want to improve your golf game and be a great ball striker right now? The Golf Swing Shirt. In the G4 Swing Trainer is an unorthodox 7 iron fitted with a super flexible shaft that can improve your rhythm and tempo while also help. Inconsistent? Let me tell you the real reason you're not playing your best golf. Hey, listen. Golfers, are you inconsistent, hitting too many fat and top shots? The iZone Golf Training Aid will help you. I'm here today with the Golf In Sync Training Aid. This training aid is going to sharpen your putting, pitching, chipping, bunker shots. Golf In Sync will help you feel what all the pros on the PGA Tour feel. It has been said that the technique of keeping the leading wrist firm is literally unteachable. Until now, the wrist firm teaches you the feel of keeping your left wrist firm and rock solid throughout the entire golf swing. Pivot Pro. The secret to power and consistency in golf is turning your chest against a braced back leg. Swaying hips result in lack of power and inconsistent golf shots. Introducing Pivot Pro, the winner of Best New Product Award. Pivot Pro's... Golf swing trainers, golf swing philosophies, golf swing fads, they have all come and gone multiple times over. There is nothing new about the golf swing. Sure, some equipment has changed and made the game easier, but if that's the case, how come the national handicap has stayed relatively the same for the last 30 years? The reality of golf is that in order to develop a consistent enough motion, you have to have time dedication, talent, finances, and an array of things go in your favor to be better than average. In today's episode, I'm going to help explain why you should be very weary of swing training tools and methods as they oftentimes destroy your natural motions and lead to a garage full of dust collecting remnants while the creators of that said tool or method are sipping on Mai Tais in their second home at the Bahamas that you help pay for. Beware of the snake ointment that plagues our industry promising you the moon and promising that separating you from your cash will easily replace the decades of work ethic needed to accomplish this quick cheat code. Sure, us teaching professionals thank them for keeping us in business as the amount of damage these tchotchkes, swing methods and fads do to your swing, we are always here to correct it. So for those teaching professionals who haven't sold their soul to plastic promising bad aids, I thank you. Watch this entire video as I will review what it takes to play this game at an above average level and what it takes to truly be a scratch golfer. If you get some education or enjoyment out of this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it, or if you really want to support us, subscribe, as these videos do take some time to make in my one-man crew. Lastly, we will also discuss your odds of improving your swing using these dust collectors better known as a retirement nest for someone else. Sit back and enjoy as we take a look at the raw truth of the golf swing. Teaching fads and aids have been around for hundreds of years. Without getting into too much detail, I made a video here giving examples on these fads and tools, so if you wish to pause this video and watch it, or come back to it after you watch this one, I would highly recommend doing so as it may open your eyes to the circus that has been in town before. Rehashing of swing aids is not new, things you see today have been done multiple times over. Before we get to the effect of swing aids on your individual motion, we have to see how we are rated. In the United States, we have the USGA and their handicap system. The system was created by Dean Newth, also known as the Pope of Slope. He created the system where each golf course sets of tees are rated. You will notice that there is a slope and a course rating for each set of tees. Course rating notes how difficult the course would be for a scratch player, while the slope rating would show how difficult the course would be for a bogey golfer. The issue with this system is it can be manipulated, so just like golf, it is mostly self-governing. Let's take a look at the USGA national average over the past 30 years. In 1991, the average handicap for women stood at 29.9, while men had 16.5. Currently, we sit at women with 26.4 and men at 14.4, so in 30 plus years, we have managed to shave two to three strokes off our handicap. 
Even at the tour level, which consists of the savant freaks, their national stroke average 71.5 in 1991 is now 71.12, just a mere 0.05 improvement over the last 30 years. This means that with all the technology available and all the swing gimmicks and teaching methods accomplished over the 30 years, the better golfer doesn't favor any of it. But does this mean you do? In total, there are roughly 3 million Americans who carry a USGA index. 3,528 of those are scratch or better, meaning that 0.73% of golfers can shoot around the course rating 25% of the time. The middle of the curve falls between 20 to 35 handicap. In relation, the average professional golfer carries a plus 5.8 handicap. If we can equate the 10,000 hour rule and apply it to golf, this would mean that you would need four years of practicing eight hours a day, five days a week to possibly give you the chance to get there. However, this does not mean that you have the talent and body set makeup to do so. To get a little deeper, the average golfer plays one to two times a month and practices one to two times a week. If the average practice time lasts one hour, the average golfer gets in 48 hours a week of practice and 48 hours of play a month. If we can take the 10,000 hour rule and apply it to the average golfer, it would take them 104 to 208 years to get the 10,000 hours of practice time alone. Not only do you need the time to afford this game, but also the skill set, hand-eye coordination, body structure, skeletal structure, muscle twitch speed, etc, etc. Even the amount of synovial fluid in your wrists can matter. In other words, the golfers we idolize on TV are freaks, and we should not try to emulate them, but learn at what they share in common with each other. So understanding all these basic statistics, why on God's good earth do we see so many swing aids, methods and ideologies revolved around tour players' actions? It is virtually impossible to replicate, and we don't live long enough as average players to put in the work and dedication that those top level golfers do. The same golfers with their ingrained savant motions that these snake oil salesmen will lead you to believe by using their system or tool will cheat the millions of golf balls and lifelong dedication it takes to achieve. In other words, they are selling you a pipe dream. The average golfer, when they do practice, typically spends a majority of their time in one area. Full swing, most notably the driver. When you only use the driver a handful of times in round of golf, I can clearly see a misuse of your valuable practice time. 70% of the game comes from 70 yards and in, and many times when I am teaching, I see our 40 stalls being used for the full swing with others lined up eagerly waiting to turn, but I can count on one hand, and I am missing two fingers, how many golfers are practicing their short game, most notably in putting. But where do all the swing aids, tchotchkes, and swing methods focused on? You guessed it, distance. It's no wonder why the National Handicap hasn't moved much in 30 years. It is a failure of sold out instructors and self-proclaimed gurus that shove down the throats of our golfers these trinkets that solely focus on skipping the line of hard work. If you as an amateur solely dedicate 75% of your practice time to short game, with the majority of that to putting, you will see a dramatic decrease in your scores. The National Handicap won't see any notable gains unless we as leaders of the game teach our students how to practice correctly. Taking a look at this very basic graph of putt make percentage, there is not much separation of make ranges from 6 feet and in, but once you get outside of that, the make ranges drop substantially between that of the average golfer and their better half. If you look at the 3 putt percentage, you will see that is where most of the amateurs suffer. Think about this, if you can eliminate one 3 putt every 3 greens, you can already shave 6 strokes off your game. Can you shave 6 strokes off your game by hitting it 10 yards further using a gimmick or theory? Stop falling for this. All you are doing is making a few people rich off your hopes. Now, don't get me wrong, there are useful training aids that when paired with an educated guide can certainly assist you, but only if the purpose of the aid or the theory fits the need of you as a student. Let's take a quick look at what the average scratch golfer statistics are and compare it to yours. I would gather that many of you don't keep detailed stats, but simple and honest stats can help you to recognize your weaknesses. 
We can see from this simple data that the average scratch golfer to top one percenter hits 12 greens in regulation, seven to eight feathers in regulation, gets up and down slightly more than half the time, and gets up and down from the bunker at an almost 60% rate. Their driving distance is 251 yards, which may shock some of you. What really stands out though is their putting. Let us compare the fairways and greens in regulation with each other. We can see that the fairways in regulation on the average golfers can hit 50% versus 60% in the scratch golfer. We can also see that greens in regulation, the average golfer hits 20 to 25%, while the scratch golfer hits 47%. One does lead to the other. In fact, if the average golfer hits a fairway in regulation, the odds increase by 50% to hit that green in regulation. So I do understand the cause and effect of wanting to hit the fairway, but this comes down to course management. If you only hit the driver 220 yards like most amateurs do, wouldn't it be worth it to try and hit a more lofted, easier club to get it in the fairway on your misses? Where you will see a huge difference is putting and ups and downs. Scratch golfers get up and down 60% of the time, where amateurs only 20% of the time. Scratch golfers average 31.5 putts per round, while the average golfer 35.8. Short game alone can contribute to six to eight shots we can easily shave if you don't buy the Kool-Aid everyone is trying to sell you. And for all of you that think you hit it 300 yards, this graph says that only 4% of golfers hit it over 300. Don't believe me? I personally invite you to come down and I can hook you up to my flight scope and see. Most amateurs hit it between 220 and 240 yards. So where do you go from here as a golfer? Well, I would highly recommend that you use your money wisely. I am biased to instruction as it is what I have done for the better part of two decades and with my 30,000 lesson history, I have seen many fads come and go. Much like clothing, they will continue to come and go to the whims of false promises. Use your hard-earned money wiser and do some research into what your game is all about. Simple statistic taking can show you where your game's weaknesses and strengths are. And from there, you can decide if you are better off spending more money on trinkets or go see a golf doctor like myself. If you do offer the latter, make sure you do some research on the instructor as there are many out there and they too also promise you things that they may not be able to achieve. The goal of this video is not to confuse you, on the contrary, it hopefully opens your eyes to what really matters in golf. We are all individuals, and no one swing is alike. When you take blanket medication for an individual problem, it will be like finding a needle in a haystack. Be wary of free advice, as you often get what you paid for. And be wary of most swing aids, fads, and theories. They may be good for education, but they most likely won't work for you. Until next time, golfers, as always, Ferris and Greens.